So in your debates with and dialogues with creationists, um, is science really the main concern or is it religion? Well, I put it a different way, whether the main concern is science or religion. <clears throat> Pardon me. I think the principal concern is philosophical, and that is where do you place scientific reason in terms of the hierarchy of ideas? And I would argue that I certainly believe, and I think most scientists believe, that scientific reason is the only way we really have to find out the truth about the natural world, to find out how things work today and what things were like in the past. And in many ways, these arguments with so-called scientific creationists are about the primacy of scientific reason. And if you investigate the natural world by making a number of faith-based assumptions and then telling science what it must discover, that's simply not going to work because that misunderstands the relationship between faith and reason. I think a proper respect for the gifts of faith and reason is to say that, yes, scientific reason is the way that we will understand the natural world as much as we are capable of, uh, of understanding it as human beings. But scientific reason doesn't answer every question that is worth answering. It doesn't tell us, as the Greeks would have said, what the good life is. It doesn't tell us what the difference is between good and evil. It doesn't tell us how we should organize and live our lives. And above all, it can't answer one of the most important questions, which is about the purpose of existence. And the reason for that is science can't answer questions about purpose at all. So therefore, science has to be agnostic, if you will, about questions of purpose and meaning and value. And I think that's where faith guides us. And I think faith guides us in that respect in a very important way. And I think there's someone who said that people of faith need to respect the agnosticism of science give it the freedom to do what it does. I think that's, I th I think that's true. And if one looks, for example, at the, uh, you might say, the early doctors and great writers of the church, and the two that always come to my mind, just because I'm familiar with their works, are St. Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, you will see in both of them a profound respect for scientific reason and a willingness to basically um, interpret scripture in a way with what is consistent with the evidence of our senses, which is the way in which Aquinas and others referred to what today we would refer to science as. I often hear um, advocates of evolution call strict creationists ignorant or crazy. And uh, Bill Nye said that when you deny evolution, quote, your worldview just becomes crazy, just untenable, itself inconsistent, unquote. And uh, John St uh, Steer, Australian atheist, he said, quote, creationism is not the alternative to evolution. Ignorance is, unquote. What do these people seek to get out of these comments? You know, how are we going to make comfort like this? Well, I don't think you convert anybody by insulting them. That's, that's the premise for which I'd start. Now, I'm not familiar with the Australian guy that you mentioned, but I do know Bill Nye, the science guy, and I think he's been a great public educator. Um, his children's programs have been terrific for getting kids interested in science, and I have a lot of respect for him that way. And in the video of which you spoke, which has been circulating around YouTube, he made an important point, and it's a point with which I agree. And the point that he made is if you personally wish to believe in things that modern science tells us are false, namely that the earth is six to 10,000 years old and humans walked alongside of dinosaurs and all this other stuff, go ahead, believe whatever you want. But please, please don't impress those beliefs on children. Don't demand that our schools teach them. And the reason for that is we need those children. We need the next generation to embrace science because we need scientific literacy to solve our problems. To that extent, I agree completely with Mr. Nye's point. Where I'd part company with him is basically in insulting the people who don't agree with me. I, don't, I, I think what you do, and what I've always tried to do with people who reject evolution, is to ask them what their objections are and then try to answer the objections. 
and let them see something as well. And here's a key point that I would make as a biologist. The reason that those of us in the biological sciences sometimes because become advocates for evolution is not because we have a problem with God. It's not because we wish, we wish to disqualify religious faith as a way of knowing, but rather it's because we are profoundly interested in understanding the truth. Scientists are interested in the world, first of all, not in a political or moral or religious agenda. Now many people who oppose evolution don't believe that. Many people think that, I'll take myself, that the reason that I've spo outspoken on evolution is because I want to convert everyone to atheism or agnosticism. And it often comes as a surprise to those yeah. people to discover that I'm a practicing Catholic. Um, and it turns out that an awful lot of people within the scientific community are people of faith. Francis Collins, who's the director of the National Institutes of Health, one of the most important scientific positions in the country, is an evangelical Christian. Uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky, who is a, I know that name is a mouthful, but he was probably the greatest evolutionary geneticist of the 20th century. Dobzhansky was also a Christian. And religious faith is much more common among scientists that many people seem willing to admit. So my, my first way of talking with Christians who are concerned about evolution is simple. And that is, I try to tell them something I believe, which is that the first duty of any Christian should be to the truth. And therefore, your first question about evolution should not be, does it contradict my understanding of the book of Genesis? Or is it congruent with references to Adam in the letters of Paul? Or does it agree with what my preacher told me on Sunday? No. Your first question about evolution should be simple. Is it true? And if it is true, from that, everything else should follow. To me, that's the way in which a Christian handles things. And you don't have to really, you can't defend truth without, um, without charity, in other words. Oh, I think that's, I, I certainly think that's true. And, and, and I do know that this is an issue that arouses very strong feelings on times when I've gone into a radio studio, um, in a, for example, in a talk radio show, as soon as the host announces we have somebody on who's got to answer questions about evolution, the switchboard just lights up with yeah. people with very, very strong feelings. So I understand that. But again, um, the way in which you address concerns like this is not to dismiss them and not to call, uh, not to call names of people, but to take the concerns seriously and try to let people understand how and why the scientific community has come to the conclusions it has. On the topic of faith, um, we mentioned this early on. It, in your view, in what ways uh, is fun, uh, fundamental creationism, uh, creationism dangerous to faith? Oh, I think that's, that's actually a very easy question to answer. Um, my concern has always been that if young people are taught in a religious context, whether it's, uh, you know, within the, the, the Catholic tradition or one of the many Protestant traditions or one of the other Abrahamic faiths, Islam or Judaism, if they are taught that their faith demands a rejection of evolution and basically um, a, a claim that there was no evidence for evolution or the, ev or the evidence is somehow insufficient or fraudulent, eventually they're going to be in an educational environment where they're going to get a chance to see the truth. They're going to get a chance to see the fossils, the DNA sequences, the comparative physiology that so strongly supports the evolutionary natural history of this planet. And at that point, if they've been told that their faith itself depends upon all these ideas being wrong, and yet they can see that there's so much evidence for them, they're going to abandon their faith. They're going to say, that's just a pack of nonsense that I was fed as a child. And I think that's ultimately very dangerous. I think we all know that recent statistics show 
that religious affiliation in the United States is going down over the last several decades. And I think there are probably many sociological reasons for that. But I don't think that the depiction of science as being at war with faith is helping that, especially in an increasingly scientific and rational age. Um, yeah. the, the, the fact of the matter is that in theological terms, the great thinkers of the church made their peace with science a very long time ago. It's also true that you know great institutions within the church, like the Vatican Observatory and the great Catholic universities in the United States and other countries have actually been pioneers of science and scientific research. And I think that's the message we need to get across to young people. So when they're confronted as they move on with their education by the strength of the scientific method and the many gifts it has given us, they don't see it in conflict with their faith.